All right. Our next, uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, about uh, technology, how we can break it open, and um, the uh, things that we're uh, missing in the whole discussion about where technology can bring us um, and, uh, and the uh, consequences, the risks, and what we should be looking out for. Um, I think we're getting there. Good, great. <laughs> Um, Matthijs Pontier is with the Pirate Party. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Pirate Party. I'm a member of the Pirate Party, so I'm a little bit biased, I've got to be honest with you. But uh, the Pirate Party is an international uh, movement that uh, once upon a time came from the Pirate Bay where there was free file sharing going on. And this free file sharing is one of the great advantages of the Internet. The Internet provides us all with the tools to get any information we want. Of course, this causes a lot of uh, ethical discussions because sometimes information or uh, data belongs to somebody and should you be able to share that openly or not. The Pirate Party is an, uh, uh, a political movement, a worldwide political movement that has thought about these topics for a long, long time, for about 10 years now. And, um, and I think our uh, next speaker is ready. So um, please welcome Matthijs Pontier from the Pirate Party. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I'm uh, Matthijs Pontier uh, from the Pirate Party. And I'm going to talk about how we can make sure that everyone benefits from technology. So uh, first, before uh, answering this question, we need to think about uh, why do we build technology? So I think we build technology for evolutionary progress, uh, for increasing our chances of survival but now also uh, uh, for a large part to improve our well-being and to, to make our life more comfortable and easier. Um, but a lot of times technology is not used in a way that makes our lives com more comfortable and easier. Uh, there's uh, two dystopian novels, uh, 1984 by George Orwell, and in uh, that novel uh, technology is used to control us and to directly control us. While with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, technology is more used in a way uh, that uh, takes advantage of our uh, addiction to stimuli, and that way they use technology to destruct us and, and still uh, control us. So then technology is used uh, to uh, realize a dystopia. So how do we use technology uh, to promote happiness? I think we should use technology to improve our autonomy. And one of these types of technologies to improve our autonomy are autonomous cars. So if you uh, have an autonomous car, you get your hands free so you can have extra time to do what you want. So you can read or you can work and be more productive uh, or you can drink without being afraid of crashing into other cars or you can do other fun stuff without being afraid to crashing into other cars. Um, and well, basically you don't need to have to be afraid uh, to, to crash into other cars because uh, autonomous cars have uh, much shorter reaction times and therefore they can be uh, a lot safer. They, they have, uh, because of the shorter reaction times, there they can drive safer than humans can. Uh, there will be less road rage and anxiety because uh, the cars drive more safely, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense to get mad at a robot. Um, and because the it makes a lot of sense to share cars, you can just order a car; it will drive towards you. Uh, you can drive to the place you need to go. And uh, then you don't need to own your own car. So uh, not everybody will do this instantly, of course, but some people will do this. Therefore, we need uh, less parking places and we have more room for plants and for people. And we can change parking lots into parks. Also, the, the cars, they can join a road train. And that way, uh, a lot more cars will fit on the road because they are much closer together. Uh, the road capacity will, will, uh, will get a boost of 273%. And also because they drive in each other's slipstream, they use a lot less energy, so we can also save energy that way. So there's a lot of great stuff, but um, we also need to change our policies because of that. We need to solve the liability issues. With it, there should be a shared responsibility between the producers of the cars, uh, the insurance companies, and perhaps the drivers if they're not fully autonomous. And we can limit building new roads because uh, a lot more cars will fit on the same amount of roads. And we can limit building parking places because we will need less. But if you look at what the governments are doing now, uh, they are really lagging behind. Only 6% of the governments consider the potential effect of this driverless technology. Uh, only 3% of the, uh, the road plans take into account services such as Uber or Lyft. 
and uh, a help of the road uh, plants, they want to build extra roads. Uh, well, a very little road plants say we shouldn't build extra roads because it's not necessary anymore in the future. And another problem is uh, uh, how corporations deal with this new technology, not because they are lagging behind, but because they're taking advantage and try to monopolize the market before everybody else knows about the possibilities. And uh, they can do so because that the, these companies, they understand that data is new gold, and therefore they will also use this data as a new gold. So they can monopolize the market uh, because they understand that data is new gold, and then uh, they will use your data as gold and sell it to other companies. So they basically, they will set up um, a corporate surveillance systems and sell your data. And uh, this leads to other policy implications, namely that we should uh, stop corporate surveillance, which is kind of ways to change policy that corporate surveillance becomes more difficult. And we need to regulate big business and make it easier for small startups because the small startups come with the innovation and big business uh, often they uh, try to stop innovation because they're making money in the old way. Uh, sometimes they are even uh, buying patents from the small startups to not use them because they're making money in the old way and they're happy doing so. Uh, so we should change policies that gives more freedom for small startups. And if you're becoming bigger and you're making more money, you need to fulfill uh, more regulations. And that's also why I like techno progressivism uh, because that way we can democratize the way technologies are built. Uh, we should uh, equally share the costs and the risks and the benefits of technology. We should give people equal access to technologies and we can develop technologies in a way that actually promotes happiness. I also think that a universal basic income becomes important with uh, the, the changing technologies. Because of, for instance, autonomous cars, but also other robots or technologies, a lot of people will use our jobs. And this is not so much a problem b if because the productivity still rises. So uh, we can still enjoy the same luxury as we did before. But of course, for the people that lose their job, it is a problem. And that's what we need to solve. And uh, the, the universal basic income is good for a lot of reasons, because it will also stop poverty, uh, because everybody will at least get the basics that they need to pay their rent and get the food. Uh, it will also stop bureaucracy, because you don't need a lot of bureaucrats that uh, decide what type of social security you can have, because everybody gets the same. Uh, there's no need for control systems that invade your privacy. There's no need for people that come to your door and check how many toothbrushes you have in your bathroom. And also there will be a level playing field on the labor market because you cannot really be forced into doing a, a bullshit job as it is, uh, the name was coined by David Graeber. Uh, but you, uh, c you only need to do a job uh, for other reasons. You, you don't need to do it uh, to pay for your food or pay for your rent, but you mainly do it for a lot of other things too. Uh, so the, 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 the power of the companies becomes a bit smaller and the power of the laborers becomes a bit bigger. Uh, it also stimulates entrepreneurship and creativity because um, science shows that if you uh, need to worry about uh, being able to pay your rent, it kills your creativity and, and you're being less creative. So if you don't need to worry about that, there will be more creative solutions in society. Also experiments with uh, basic income show that people get more education, there's more entrepreneurship, people start doing more useful work, and uh, people have less health problems because they need to worry less basically. So if you have a basic uh, income before a basic income, uh, mainly people work for money to live, but after a basic, uh, basic income, they work more for self-improvement, for meeting people, for enjoyment, and for helping the community. But there's not only autonomous cars, there's a lot of technology being developed. Uh, as a scientist, I worked on emotional intelligence for robots. So I looked at models from psychology and social science about how humans basically work emotionally. And uh, I, uh, uh, change these models into computer models so that computers and robots can use it to act emotionally human-like. Uh, I tested this in a speed dating experiment in which uh, female students, they interacted with this agent and uh, then uh, in the one condition this agent was controlled by these uh, emotion regulation model or the, the emotional intelligence models and in the other uh, condition it was controlled by a real human and then they couldn't see a difference. So this, this really shows that this technology works in a way. And it is uh, implemented in a uh, healthcare robot and uh, elderly people got these robots in, in a house and it could uh, do a lot of nice things for them. For instance, it could help them with uh, reminders of sending a letter to your loved ones. So if they're lonely, uh, a lot of times they get isolated and they also 
don't really get proactive anymore and the robot could really help them in doing so. So it's all uh, also nice things, but also here there's a uh, downside because if you have a robot that is emotionally intelligent, it knows about your emotions, it knows about how your emotions can change, then it has a lot of power to persuade people. And this can be used in a good way, but also in a bad way. So th then th the question raises, if you have smart technology, and we are having a lot of different types of smart technology already, if this technology thinks for you, then do the programmers tell you what to think? So that, that's really an issue that we need to solve. And I think we can solve this uh, at least partly through machine ethics. So if machines have a lot of power to ma manipulate people, then we need to make sure that these machines do not harm us, do not threaten our autonomy, and basically treat us in a good way. So we developed a moral reasoning system. For, uh, there was first, it was focusing on a healthcare setting, but I think it can be used in more settings. So it balances between four moral goals. Uh, one is autonomy, so not doing stuff uh, against people's will. Uh, beneficence, making people better. Uh, Non-maleficence, not harming people. And justice, so basically treating people equally. And because autonomy is such a crucial sector in this model, we expanded this into negative autonomy and positive autonomy. Uh, the negative autonomy is more about the right to be left alone if you don't want to be bothered. So that's about privacy, about respecting mental integrity, about respecting physical integrity. Uh, and positive autonomy is more about enabling people to make a well-reflected choice. So uh, providing people with adequate information, uh, helping with cognitive functioning, and stimulating reflection in people. And these models were able to simulate decisions made by medical ethical experts and by judges. And also these autonomous cars already uh, need to make ethical decisions. What you see here is a trolley dilemma. So if the, there's a train coming, it will drive over these five people, but you can set a switch to drive over one person instead of five. Now how many people here would uh, 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 set a switch to kill one person instead of five? Can I see some hands? Yeah, so most people, that, that's actually uh, what, uh, what usually people say. Um, and this is a decision that cars need to make, especially because they can make this decision because they have such a quick reaction time. Um, and therefore, I think it's uh, important that we have mandatory machine ethics at some point, not only because of these kinds of issues, but also because at some point, uh, a lot of uh, smart people predict that there will be intelligence explosion and that robots will become smarter than humans. And most people sitting here will hopefully uh, still uh, um, live through this so that, that, that we will uh, have a situation in which robots become smarter than us. But then uh, there could be a situation in which robots decide that they wanna kill humans. Of course, there's a lot of moves about this, like the Terminator and stuff like that. And uh, some people say this is maybe far-fetched, but there's a lot of really smart people that are saying that this is a real risk that we need to address like for instance, Nick Bostrom or Elon Musk from Tesla or Stephen Hawking. And uh, it makes maybe a bit more sense if you think that we're actually building robots to kill people. That's why as a scientist, I already uh, joined the campaign to stop killer robots because I don't think we should build technology to kill people. I think we should build technology to make our lives better and not to destroy lives. And um, another thing that I like to, uh, to say about this is that there's also a thought experiment about uh, machines that are really not made to destroy us, but uh, it's uh, a paperclip machine. And in this thought experiment, there's a paperclip machine. Uh, it has uh, a lot of intelligence to find, of, uh, to find intelligent ways to build a lot of paperclips, but uh, it cannot be connected to the internet. And then at some point, it is being connected to the internet, and then because of its processing all this information, it finds a way to use the atoms that are in humans to build paperclips, so the next time the humans come into the office, it has find a way to build uh, uh, some poisonous gas. All the humans die. It uses all the atoms of the humans and of all the other stuff to build paper clips. It will produce a new paper clip robot. And uh, there will just be a big army of paper clip robots that were not really made to harm us, but they just built a lot of paper clips. And they basically conquer the universe, building a lot of large stacks of paper clips. Uh, so I think we should at some point make uh, machine ethics mandatory, that every intelligent system uh, has uh, an ethical, uh, a system of ethical values uh, so that it treats humans nicely. Uh, this, uh, this is also called AI safety. And this way we can make sure that if there's an intelligence explosion that we actually benefit from it, 
and it is not used to uh, lead to our extermination. Um, and also, uh, you know, a bit less in the future, but, but more in the now. Uh, this way we can democratically uh, decide about uh, ethics uh, in technology. So together we can decide about what this ethics should be and uh, how technology should treat us as humans because they're, you know, they're, they're basically, they're going to be new beings that join uh, us. Like other biological animals, you can see it as a new type of animals that joins us. And therefore I also think that uh, every AI should be open source because that's the only way that you can check uh, whether this AI behaves as we together decided it should behave. Uh, we, can, we can use it, uh, otherwise uh, there's no way that we can control the programmers and only a small bunch of programmers has a lot of power uh, over everyone else because they control the technology and the technology has a really large influence on our lives. And further, I also think that good ideas are made to be copied. So uh, if we uh, build a good AI, and other people want to use it to build a better AI, and everyone does that, we will have much faster progress than we have now. And we are creating extra value in society without cost. Uh, I wrote, uh, together with uh, Simon van Rijsterwijk, I edited a book about this. Uh, you can buy it, but you can maybe also find a pirated copy online. I wonder how that got there. Um, anyway, during uh, this uh, de developing this machine ethics at the university, I also decided to join the pirate party. And of course, as a scientist, I liked uh, the part of free sharing of information, art and culture. Uh, of course, as a scientist, I liked evidence-based policy with long-term vision. Uh, but of course, I also liked simulating self-determination and at the same time keeping our right. And uh, I liked the part that we trust civilians, but we do not trust power institutions. So we want to give more trust to the civilians themselves and take power away from power institutions, for instance, by transparent uh, governance. Uh, we're enthusiastic about tech, but we're alert on the risks. And uh, we like to use tech to empower people and not to repress people. So one uh, good way to use tech to empower people is eDemocracy. It's an online platform where everybody can post IDs and discuss those IDs and make decisions together. And you know, you, know, you don't really need uh, a powerful politician or something to make decisions because you can make them all together. And it's all about IDs, so you vote on the IDs not on the parties or on the persons. And this way you can use the power of those IDs to replace the idea of a need for power. So this is uh, one, one type of e-democracy software. Your priorities is used in many places. Uh, we're also going to use this kind of software in uh, Amsterdam. Um, uh, more than 600,000 people have used it uh, in the past year. So um, th this, this technology is really uh, increasingly being used. It's uh, free and open source. Uh, everybody can use it if you want to uh, increase democracy or you want to set up a platform to share IDs. Uh, everybody can do this. And uh, this is how it works. So everybody can add IDs. Everybody can add arguments for and against these IDs. And this way, the best IDs and arguments automatically come up. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is in Greek so that you don't focus on the content, but you focus on what the system looks like. Uh, here's an ID. Uh, here you can add arguments for the ID. And here you can add arguments against the ID. And they, those are in separate columns, and this is done uh, to prevent that people are going to argue about each other's IDs, but they, they really have a debate about the ID itself. So the way the system is set up, it stimulates a rational debate about the actual IDs. You can also have representation in e-democracy. So uh, you don't uh, vote once every few years, but you can always adjust your vote. And you can also uh, vote for different people or in, on different subjects. So you can say, okay, I, I like this guy, Hank, he knows a lot about education, so I give uh, Hank my vote on education, and there's another guy called Pete, and he, he knows a lot about healthcare, so I give Pete my vote on healthcare. And representation is all, always voluntarily. So you can always say, okay, now I want to make decisions uh, for myself because uh, he messed up, uh, I, I didn't like what he was doing with my vote, so now I take my vote back and give it to someone else, or I, I'm going to make decisions for myself. And this way, um, it makes representation much more personal and it also implies a lot of trust. So this is a really good way to bring back trust in politics. Ah, there's one slide missing here, but uh, um, I also like uh, how they uh, made a new constitution in Iceland. It was um, made by a, a national assembly 
uh, there were, uh, and it was uh, a crowdsourced constitution. So there was a, a bunch of elected people, they held assemblies, uh, they were shown online, they were asking for input from all civilians, and thousands of civilians gave input for a better constitution for Iceland. And uh, this, this really worked, and people were really happy about this. Uh, the politicians didn't like it that much, because at some point uh, during the process there came a conservative government. Uh, there was held a referendum about the new constitution. Uh, Two-thirds of the people in Iceland voted for the new constitution that was created by the people. But the politicians said, no, nah, we're not going to use it. And a lot of people got mad. Um, and uh, the Pirate Party made a really big point of it, like, you, you, you killed our constitution, we want it back. Uh, and, well, that, that, that worked pretty well for the Pirate Party because they had three seats and now they're scoring over 40% in the polls. Uh, so a lot of people are having a lot of hope that because of the Pirate Party, uh, the, the people's constitution will still be there. And uh, inspired by this story of how it went in Iceland, we also decided to crowdsource the constitution for the European Union. Um, as you maybe know, there, there was uh, a constitution for Europe that was not created by the people, but it was created by some politicians. And uh, there was held a referendum, and then it was voted down because people didn't think it was a good constitution. And after it was voted down, there was a Lisbon Treaty, which was largely the same, but no referendum was held, and they didn't follow the Constitution, and they just said, yeah, okay, now we have this Lisbon Treaty. And I think this is uh, symbolic for the, for the democratic deficit in the EU. I think the EU is uh, very important for a lot of things. Problems become much more international, so you need to think of international ways to solve these problems. But uh, if you have an EU, it should be an EU by the people and for the people. So therefore, we decided to crowdsource the constitution uh, on the platform I just explained. And we want to combine uh, online sessions uh, with offline sessions. So everybody can participate on the platform. But I would also invite people to organize a crowdsourcing session, sit together with a group of people, and think of what could be in this constitution. It can be values, it can be in the constitution, it can be principles, or you can just write articles and discuss them and vote them up and down. So you can go to the website peoplesconstitution.eu and you can directly participate. You can follow us on Twitter, Crowdsource EU, or Facebook, Crowdsource Europe. Um, and we also have uh, a crowdsourcing station at the Fab City Campus of Europe by People in uh, Amsterdam at the Java Islands. Uh, and there you can always uh, submit IDs, discuss them, uh, and find more information. And there will also be someone there to help you if you're there. So I want to thank you, and I want to say just one thing. Uh, we will have um, elections for the least candidate of the Pirate Party. Uh, you can still uh, submit an application until 1st of June, and then uh, the next weekend we'll have pitches, and 26th of June uh, we will elect a new least candidate. I'll probably be a candidate myself. I'm not sure if there's someone else here that will also be a least candidate, but um, if you want to, uh, you can uh, dis uh, join the discussion about this, and vote for the new lead candidate for Pirate Party. So thank you. Thank you, Matthijs. I know I'm going to have nightmares uh, about paperclip robots tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, do, I do have a question. Are you, am I, do I get it wrong that you are one of the ver few uh, scientists in the world that's uh, more concerned with ethics than what is technically possible? Um, I'm, I'm not alone in this, and uh, also people like Elon Musk and, and Stephen Hawking, they are, they are really addressing this issue. Also Nick Bostrom and the Singularity Institute. But uh, of course, in, in AI, a lot, and a lot of people are focusing on what can we do, and, and of course it makes sense. And also, um, if you look at how science works and how you get money for science, um, it's more easy to get money for building new or great stuff than uh, for nagging about uh, maybe we should limit some things and maybe we shouldn't build this because it will lead to m worse things than we have now. You know, it is, it's of course more difficult. But I, I like that there are of also, for instance, this campaign to stop killer robots. It was joined by a lot of AI people and it really gives me hope that uh, there are some good people in tech. So that maybe we should think twice of before we get, we get the killer robots. Yeah, all right. Um, are there any other questions in the audience? Killer robots? No questions? There's a question. <laughs> the people's constitution? I'm bringing my mic over to you. Hold on. It's a bit of a walk. I'm getting my workout today. This is great. <laughs> hi. Yes, hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you have thought of 
blockchain technologies helping in general uh, electronic democracy? Blockchain technologies. Yeah, yeah, that could, blockchain technology can be really useful for electronic democracy. This, the, the platform that we're using now is really open. There's not really any checks. Uh, there's uh, uh, very much a, a self-regulating mechanism because uh, good IDs are voted up and bad IDs are voted down. Uh, also in Reykjavik, uh, more than half of the people use it. It was uh, 70,000 out of 120,000 people. And automatically, if there was something racist or insulting, it was just voted down and people don't see it anymore. So, um, but if there's decisions that are being made about a lot of money and it, it makes a lot of sense to hack the system, then of course blockchain technology could really solve this issue. Do I get it right that that's a little bit like uh, like on the website Reddit, where you get like upvotes and downvotes? Is it yeah. a little bit like, like that? Yeah, it's like that. All right. Any other questions? Killer robots? People's constitution? No more questions. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I thought you had a question. You were like looking at me like, yeah, yeah, maybe actually. Uh, you say you say that information should be free, but uh, there's a lot of uninteresting information and the interesting information, it costs a lot of effort and money to create it. And if you make all information free, uh, yeah, the creative people will stop creating books or films, movies, and that kind of thing. So I didn't get that. No, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of... Um, there, there's more ways of making money than uh, just uh, building a fence around it and uh, having a guy ask money to get it. Uh, also, this way of uh, monetizing creative work, it also uh, leads to a system in which there is a copyright industry. They make most of the money, and uh, the people who actually create only get a little bit. So uh, there's a lot of uh, different methods to, to also monetize uh, doing creative work. And also, um, the, the market already shows that it, that it works this way. Because since the download area, uh, the, the gains in the music industry, in the film industry, they have all risen. Because there's a lot of ways to make money on creative work, not just asking money and, and building a fence. Did that answer your question a little bit? Maybe. <laughs> Uh, I know yesterday uh, the uh, Pirate Bay uh, founder, Peter Sunde, was at another conference where he uh, introduced uh, a Flatter, which is like a little app that goes on, the, on, w on websites. And if you like an article, you can click on it and you have like a monthly donation system. And then if you click on it, you, you get like a, uh, they get like a tip. The author get like, gets like a tip for producing the content. I see another question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> you have a question? Uh, just as a follow-up to what you just said, there's been services from before what the Pirate Bay guy just launched called uh, ProTip by Chris Ellis or a Tidbit, a startup from London that started tipping for uh, original content on the internet. But besides that, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on negative autonomy? Uh, negative autonomy, it, it uh, consists of privacy and mental integrity and physical integrity. So uh, to have uh, a good negative autonomy, uh, you, you need to make sure that people are not invading your privacy. You need to make sure that they are not nagging when you don't want them to nag. And you need to make sure that they, uh, for instance, don't lock you up if there's no good reason for it. Does that answer your question? or? Uh, yeah, it does answer my question. I, I was just thinking maybe there's a bit more to it, maybe some more uh, dark aspects of why autonomy may be overrated or maybe that's not the right word sorry i didn't really get it so can, can you formulate that question a little bit more clearly well it just sounded strange that something like autonomy could be a negative thing that's why i wanted to hear maybe s if there's more aspects to it no yeah it's it's a it's um a, a division of autonomy so you know negative autonomy is a good thing you need to have negative autonomy as well as positive on autonomy but it's, uh, or it's also called negative liberty and positive liberty. Um, it's, it's different ways of addressing liberty. And a lot of people, when they focus on liberty, they focus only on the thing that's being called negative liberty. So just being left alone when you don't want to and uh, always being able to do what you want. But uh, to, to bring more nuance to this concept, 
uh, positive liberty was it added, which is more, you know, it's, it's more a positive approach, which is more about enable, enabling people to really make free choices. Because if you're, um, if you're left alone and you can do whatever you want, but you're constantly manipula being manipulated into doing stuff that's good, for, for instance, for a corporation, and, but not so good for yourself, but still you're being manipulated into doing that, uh, is that really liberty? Are you really autonomous then? And uh, I don't think so. And that's why you need negative liberty as well as positive liberty. So th th is it, uh, does that explain it? Yeah, it's pretty complicated stuff, actually. Any other questions? All right, and we're done. <laughs> uh, are you going to be around, uh, Matthijs, to ask, uh, to like have a little talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with people? Maybe you want to yeah, sure. go into the copyright thing a little bit? Yeah, yeah <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. There really is. Uh, all right. Thank you so mu mu much, yeah, thank you Doctor too. Doctor Matthijs. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I know we have a gift for you backstage, so don't okay. don't forget to pick that up. Thank okay. you. Give it a hand of applause, please, for Doctor Matthijs Pontier.